Hi, Misha here, and we're going to do something we haven't done in, in a couple of years, really. We're going to talk about the M14, or at least a version of it. I've had these in the shop a few times over the years. Of course, they haven't been allowed in in well over a quarter of a century. This is the Chinese M14S, a.k.a. the M14 Sporter. And this video is not going to be about M14 history as such, but I thought we would talk about five claims made about these Chinese guns and evaluate them. Are they true? Are they factual? Are they completely myth? Are they wrong? Or is it circumstantial? Is it a story? I don't know. Just... Why not? Interesting guns, and that I would share it with you. Full disclosure, I am the opposite of an expert when it comes to the M14 and M1A. We'll, we'll say that Chris Bartacci is the expert. Now, I, I just have a passing interest. I do find them fun, but um, feel free to correct me or add to what I say, because uh, I know that I don't know near everything even close to it about these. Also with that in mind, if you could please do like, share, and subscribe. And you know the drill, if you'd like to help the channel, there's a link to some Patreon stuff. But with that, let's get into it. So I have my USGI M14 out, or rather it's a parts kit on a Simato receiver. And that goes to show you definitely broad strokes, these are identical spec. A little over 46 inches long, depending on the ex exact stock it's in. 22 inch barrel, plus the muzzle device. Both chambered for 7.62 NATO, both feeding from 20 round GI mags. This one has got a short 10 rounder in it, but it'll take 20s. Both have the same style of sight, stripper clips, triggers, yeah. This is, for all intents and purposes, the exact same dimensions, fit, feel of a M14, or a, rather M1A, which is why we're not really shooting this. I thought if I'd found some time, I would have brought it out. I just didn't. It's going to shoot just like this one, and I do have some shooting footage of that, so here you go. M14. <laughs> I do enjoy shooting the M14 M1A. It just so happens that I enjoy shooting the BM59, FAL, G3, set me more. It, it's in just stiff competition, so it doesn't come out often, but it, a collection just would not be complete without it. But of course, it has the dubious honor of being a very short-lived frontline service weapon mostly in the early stages of the Vietnam War and then kind of reserve use and then a few specialty uses like the M21, M25. So, why why did China make the M14S, M14 Sporter, how they do it? That gets us into our first claim of the day. BM59, last mag of the day. Alright, the SAR3. Armalite AR10, first shots. Held open. I was getting pelted in the knuckle the entire time. No matter where knuckle. I moved. You said knuckle. Right? Knuckle, yes, I said knuckle. Okay, just making sure. And nipple. There are two claims here. Number one, some have claimed that the uh, People's Republic of China, Communist China, obtained tooling, the production line, Springfield, Winchester, HRA, it's been said all, 
and so they started making these in the late 60s 70s unlicensed over there now it's not so that they got the line directly from the u.s but rather taiwan the republic of china those of you who know history see the problem with this right away this is false there is uh, there's no way that taiwan was giving china any technology much less a full production line for a U.S. battle rifle. A counterclaim. In the late 60s, they had quite a few M14s that had been captured in Vietnam and made their way back to China. And they used these as templates, along with, I'm sure, espionage and other things, to reverse engineer M14s. Keep in mind, this is a pretty old school gun with not a whole lot of cutting edge tech going into it. Not to say it's a bad gun, but a machined receiver, typically a walnut or birch stock, chrome line bore, you know. So not something that China would not be capable of uh, copying. Now why would they do this? Did they want it for their own army? The claim is no. They were actually producing them with fake US markings and proofs and then planning them to give to armed revolutionaries and dissidents around the world, making it look like the weapons were from the USA. Because while a lot of people use the FAL, not many countries use the M14. And if they got traced back to, say, Taiwan instead of the USA, that's okay too. Either way, for China, that is. This, while I don't know if it's been 100% factually confirmed, is a much more plausible story. They had to have had some reason to do this. It said that they made roughly 100,000 select fire guns, and one of the revolutions they were hoping to support was in the Philippines, but after a couple of failed attempts to ship the M14s over and changing political tides, of course, the relations between the U.S. and China got much more friendly in the 70s, the project was abandoned. While neither one I can completely myself actually confirm, number two I definitely think is much more plausible. No way did uh, the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China cooperate in that manner. But there is a kernel of truth there and we can actually kind of see where the misunderstanding came from. It's because people are mixing up the two Chinas. In 1967, Taiwan sought to produce the M14 domestically. It would be adopted as the Type 57 or T57, and with the closure of the original Springfield Armory, the production line, tooling, all that, all that stuff was sent to, um, to Taiwan over there. Some say it was the old Winchester line or Harrington Richards, but... I don't know, Springfield seems much more likely since it was a government arsenal and all that stuff. Either way, they got the tooling from America, and they started building them by 1969. And this was their front-line service gun through the 70s until it was replaced. And they wouldn't actually wrap up Type 57, T-57 production until the 80s. And the guns are still at least in reserve today, sometimes used for training, sometimes for guard duty and they were said to have made hundreds of thousands some sources say up to a million that seems like a lot because the u.s made under 1.4 million but who knows they did produce them for longer but i think that's where the whole connection gets blurred as people saw people's republic of china republic of china 1967 68 yada 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 tooling transferred to asia and it all got kind of mucked up in the mix what do you think please forgive me this one tangent i very much am supporting taiwanese self-determination independence and since we're talking about the t57 i had to mention of course the t65 rifles they would develop and one of my favorite guns that i have the t 91 the carbine version these were actually made at the same state arsenal known today as 203 as the uh, 
M14 clones they had. Their M14s looked very much like a GI, but they had different fit and finish. And uh, they would make mags and bipods. But uh, yeah, I just uh, had to bring this out. Rem reminded me too much of it. In fact, here is a shooting clip from a couple years ago. And then I promise we'll move on. T91 Tactical, T91, not bad. Claim number two. The Chinese semi-automatic M14s were built on a forged military spec, mil spec receiver. Equal to an M14 and actually maybe superior to something like a Springfield M1A. If we continue on with the idea they made full autos or select fire versions for illicit purposes in the 70s, the story continues that since they had nothing to do with them, they put them in storage. In the 80s, with the expanding U.S. civilian market, they would make new ATF-compliant semi-automatic receivers, often using older parts originally put on those select fire guns to produce the M14S, M14 Sporter. Regardless of exactly how they came to be, the fact is by 1988 they were hitting American shores. And, well, the receivers are very well respected. The original US receiver for the military was forged, but yes, Springfield and many others have switched to investment casting, leading many to assert that the Chinese receivers are superior. What's the truth in that? Well, the Chinese receivers are forged. However, it is a slightly different type of steel. It's a 5100 steel, whereas the uh, GI, USGI receivers were 8620 steel. The... Uh, Chinese receivers were a chromium, chrom, chromium, there we go, chromium alloy. The uh, GI receivers would have been, well, they had some chromium traces in them. They had some nickel. They had some molybdenum, which is just a fun word to say and a few other things. I don't think it matters, but it is a different type of steel. But over the years, these Chinese guns have been here, and you don't hear of excessive receiver failure. So... All in all, while the receivers aren't exactly mil-spec, different steel, the process is the same, and the end result seems to be the same. I will say that according to some government testing and, and whatnot, it's, they thought that the GI receiver would last 400,000 rounds or more. I don't know if anyone's put a Chinese receiver to that test, but they've held up quite well since they've come in. So I'm going to say this is, if you're going to be 100% technical, not true, but yeah, let's let's not do that. Let's just say it's, it's factually true. It's on a good forged receiver. It is much closer to USGI spec than an M1A's receiver. By the way, all M1A receivers, even going back to the 70s, were cast. So there you go. Go ahead. M14 and <laughs> Claim number three. Yeah, the receivers are good, but the bolts, they're soft. They're bad. If you get a Chinese M14, you need to replace the bolt ASAP. This one has been hotly debated for decades, but there seems to have been a general consensus. Obviously, original GI bolts like in this one, hold up just fine. The Chinese bolts, on the other hand, have been problematic. Some have genuinely lost headspace. But I don't know that anyone has been seriously injured because of that, 
more like the guns just failed to work or accuracy goes to complete crap. Part of that's that's just kind of the design of the gun. But would you believe it's something that has been blown out of proportion? And this is really even before the internet existed. Yeah, I know people had uh, hyperbole even before YouTube. Well, here's what I've uncovered and what I think. Let me know if you agree, and if you disagree, please present it in the comments respectfully. I'll be respectful to you, you be respectful to me, but uh, this is what I've kind of concluded over the years. The Chinese guns, much like real military ones, were chambered for true 762 NATO, not 308. On top of that, they were kind of long chambered, so towards that end of spec meaning that right out of the box, sometimes they would swallow a no-go gauge, or even after just being shot a bit, because they will open up. Any gun will, but the M14 design will open up after being fired. But don't panic. For one, no-go and go gauges are meant for assembly construction new at the factory. They're not really meant for testing as a gun's being fired. For use in the field, at home, well, that's why we have a field gauge. If one of these still passes the field gauge test, I wouldn't worry. Now, if it fails a field gauge, especially a 762 NATO, not a 308, then you're going to need to do something about the bolt. But if it's, it's still going there, just shoot it. And you don't have to be too hyper vigilant, but maybe every four, five hundred rounds, or if it starts behaving weird, you start seeing kind of weird brass, check it. But if it's, if the brass is looking fine, it's gripping fine, it, you know how a gun gets. Once you know a gun, you know how it feels. When a gun starts losing headspace, it starts acting weird. And that's, I know that's very subjective, very hard to say, but it's true. Yeah, I bet a lot of you know what I'm talking about. You know when your gun's just not doing right. So if it feels right and it passes a field gauge, I wouldn't worry. So while there were soft bolts, it uh, was one of those issues that was much overblown. And I think a lot of American companies took advantage of that because there were services to swap in a USGI bolt. And there had to be modifications made to fit it, especially if you wanted to retain the Chinese barrel. So there was a bit of a profit involved in convincing people to swap perfectly good parts out of their guns, especially when a few were failing. From what I've noticed, most of the really poor bolts were earlier production. It said that China actually kind of tightened things up into the 90s, so this might be one of the few instances where a post-ban gun is uh, more desirable than a pre-ban. Of course, that's getting into the weeds, but we'll get to that later in a claim. So I just don't feel like the bolt thing is that big of a deal. If it was, you would see a lot more of these either not being able to be shot or blowed up over the years, and you, you, just, don't, you just don't see that. So, there's a kernel of truth, but all in all, I'm going to say it's a story verging on a myth. But, there is tr some truth there. So, caveat emptor, I suppose. Bonus claim. You notice this is in a synthetic stock. That's because these came with uh, kind of light wood stocks that a lot of people didn't like. And uh, there was a frankly a myth that they were made out of so-called chew wood or other weird things. Now it seems like they were actually a type of walnut, maybe elm. There's some elm being used, but probably walnut, just not military grade. They were kind of slick. So you do see a lot of the stocks getting swapped out, not because they were breaking or anything wrong with them, but just because people didn't like them aesthetically. On the other hand, the receiver wasn't the only good part. The barrels, 22 inches, 
were chrome lined and seemed to be pretty good. Now, I don't know if they would make it to the full range and wear patterns of a USGI barrel, but they hold that fine, especially in semi auto only. The Oprod 2, actually a very critical part in an M1 Grand and M14. These were a machine to forge component. And they hold up fine. The springs, while some people will replace them, especially after they've shot a few thousand rounds, they seem fine. The trigger group, fine. Sights, I mean, they're, they're sights. So most of the rest of the parts were, were, were solid on these. Maybe if not quite as good as USGI, they weren't piss poor either. Of course, we'll talk about this in a minute. Also, I've noticed that the Chinese upper handguard is a different type of synthetic material compared with the uh, 50s style Bakelite handguard on a USGI. Looks similar, but it's a different chemical makeup. Much more modern. So there you go. Little bonus thing before we move on. M14. Number four, it's claimed that this is the best one. By that I mean a Polytech M14S imported by IDE with the markings on the receiver side on the wall instead of on the heel. Is it true? Well, I've got this gun here, so... For my purposes, it would be nice if it were true. Unfortunately, I'm very dubious about at least most of this claim. Let me explain. Polytech exported, under that name, the M14S. Norinco exported the M14 Sporter, or as it was sometimes marked, the m 305. So you have Noriko and Polytech guns coming out with slightly different names. The issue, no matter which name on the side, they were all made at Chinese Factory 356, the Yunnan factory. So they all came from the same factory. Now it's possible that Polytech ordered them with more fit and finish, more time. But it's not likely that there's any substantive difference. The Chinese guns, almost everyone will agree, the metal finishing and the bluing is fine, it's adequate, but it's not US spec. They're just not as well polished out, everything like that. It's not a knock against them, they were 500 bucks versus 1500 bucks. They were half to a third the price of a Springfield, which, you know, had a presumably less desirable receiver. Now, as I was saying, with the Polytex, we have two importers, IDE and also Kang's, KFS. Why would IDE be better than Kang's if they're both bringing over Polytex? I don't really know. I will say that, like I said, some had a heel mark like this, and some were all on the side. Regardless, the cereals were always on the side. This could be where I'm wrong, so correct me, please. But I think maybe earlier guns had the heel mark, and then they moved to the side. If that's the case, it could be that, yes, the side mark guns are less problematic than the earlier heel marks just based on when they came in because China did improve their manufacturing, like we talked about with the Bolt, and a few other small things over time. We're not talking huge leaps forward, just slightly better. So it could be that a side mark gun, by being the later version, is a little bit better of a bet. But... Again, I'm 
kind of speculating myself there. As for the Norinco branded guns, the only importer I'm aware of, at least the big one, was Century Arms, who also sold some Polytex. As a bit of an aside, I do know that in the 90s, Century received by accident a batch of M14 guns with selector capable receivers. Needless to say, those were not sold to the public. They uh, they got scrapped. Actually, they got turned into parts kits and later rebuilt onto U.S. receivers. So as far as I know, yeah, you had IDE and KFS for the Polytech, and you had Century Arms, primarily Norinco, but also a few Polytechs as well. I've seen claims that there were a couple of other importers, and seeing how many other companies brought over AKs and SKSs, I could believe it. I just haven't run across them or their names so if you know please do uh, share so while I'll say maybe later M14s are slightly more desirable I really just don't think guns all coming out of the same factory are going to be leaps better than any other guns it probably just falls down like it does in normal factories is it a Monday morning Friday afternoon gun or is it a uh you know, Tuesday, Wednesday gun when someone's just a little more on their game. I don't know, but I'm going to say this one is mostly myth with just a tiny bit of truth in the uh, in the center there. But what do you think? Again, not an expert. So please, if you disagree, feel free to do that. But also, if you do, please explain why. M14, last minute. Claim number five, and this is a bit of a catch-all, but it does tie together. Post-ban, pre-ban, dates, what happened when, what came over, what you can do, what you can't do. You know what I mean, that kind of stuff. It just seemed like a good thing to lump it all into. Let's get into it and see where there are some errors and some truths. Okay, first off, some hard facts. The so-called pre-ban M14s were prohibited after March of 1989 because of an executive order that was supposed to be part of a tough on drugs thing, war on drugs thing, signed by George H. Bush. This is a fact. The entire importation ended in 1994, but a common mistake I've read is many think it was because of the crime bill, the assault weapons ban, passing in September of that year, when in reality, Chinese guns, at least rifled guns, not shotguns, were sanctioned in April already. So by the time the crime bill, the assault weapons ban, went into effect, these were already prohibited several months earlier. I'm not going to get into the politics why. Let's just say America and China disagreed about what China was doing, what they were shipping, how they were shipping it, and where they were shipping it to, and leave it at that. What is a fact is no more came in after the spring of 1994, meaning importation, Polytech and Norinco, ran from 88 to 94. Now that was just, of course, America. China did export these, especially under the Model 305 name, to several other nations, Australia, in New Zealand back when they would allow that. Canada, which that actually lasted up until 2020, when because COVID wasn't bad enough, May 1st, they decided to reclass the Chinese M14 as a prohibited firearm. Thanks. And some even made their way over to a few European nations, uh, most notably that I've kind of picked up on, Italy. You see quite a few. I should say that um, while pretty much all the ones we received here were the 7.62 NATO 22-inch version. There was an M305A sold elsewhere, which was a 7.62x39 version that it took AK mags. So think of like a mini four, uh, excuse me, a mini 30. And there was also an M305B, which had an 18 and a half inch shortened barrel. So kind of like a Springfield bush rifle or, you know, modern SOCOM. I just found that kind of interesting. 
So that's uh, th those are those are factual things that are for sure. Also a fact, the gun shipped with uh, two to three magazines. China made very decent copies of the 20 round steel mag, still at factory three five six, and uh, Taiwan did too. In fact, the, the mags made in China and Taiwan are very very similar. They're slightly different spec, a little bit. Uh, narrower because of using metrics versus uh, imperial inch pattern but they they work fine not as well respected china and taiwan both made clones of the m2 bipod as seen on the m14 a1 and others and uh, they're okay for the money but they're not great you can tell a chinese one because they're marked w m i but it gets a little murky there and they shipped them with typically a sling and a buttstock cleaning kit. No bayonet, though. So, speaking of bayonet, what's really the difference besides the dates of pre-ban and post-ban? Really, not much. All importers had to do to make these compliant after 1989 was use this front sight. And assembly. On an, on an M14, M1A, this is all one unit with a castle nut here that locks it on. Bayonet lugs down here, flash hider. They basically took that, never machined out the slots, so it's just a dummy, and machined off the bayonet lug. Castle nuts here. Some have claimed that these were often welded or pinned. I don't know, with all the ones I've seen, you could just unscrew, but I'm sure some were welded especially after 94 when assault weapons ban and all that good stuff. But um, others have said that they would just sometimes cut off the flash hider and just have a spare. Which, to be fair, this is doing nothing aside from giving it a bit of a look. But that's all they had to do. Everything back here, because of the way the 89 was written, so-called high-capacity mags, mags over 10 rounds, were still not considered evil at that time. That would not happen until 1998 under President Bill Clinton. So, actually, during the assault weapons ban, I remember very clearly, M1As, M14s were a very popular choice because they did not have to be heavily neutered. You don't have a pistol grip. The vast majority don't have folding stocks. So, you actually were allowed, under the terms of the uh, assault weapons ban, assault rifle ban in the country to have a flash rider. You, the only thing they really had to do here, like with the Springfield M1A, was chop off the lug. Imports, on the other hand, were held to a higher standard, so that's why no flash rider. Just a little side note there. Until the very end, they still shipped them mostly with 20 round mags. This one, they just had the 10 rounder in it when it came into the shop, so that's why it's here. But, um, yeah, that's importation. As far as I know, Century was the last one to bring these in, getting several cotton customs in 1994. So what if you own one? What can you do? What can't you do? Well, if you own a pre-ban, leave it as is. If you need to, maybe swap out the bolt. Like I said, if you want to keep the Chinese barrel, which I would, some fitting is required. But then again, even with U.S. builds, the M14 often requires some fitting. Nominally, most M14 parts will work in these with fitting. For example, the stocks can go back and forth. But some of the threading is different because of metrics versus imperial. Interestingly, the barrels have the same thread pitch, so you could take this off and put on here if you wanted to restore features. But some other smaller things wouldn't necessarily straight interchange or would need some you know gun some minor gunsmithing to do. I'm sure you can look up on that if you need to, but they're pretty well parts compatible. Let's say 80%. And it seems like oftentimes Chinese guns can take American parts easier than American guns can take Chinese, if that makes sense. Which makes sense. Original clone versus yeah. So Let's say you didn't get a pre-ban because they only came over for a year. And you've got a post-ban like this imported between 1990 and 1994. What are your options? 
Well, let's go back to 94 to 2004 during the 10 years of the assault weapons ban. You were allowed to have 20 round mags as long as they were made before September of 1994. They were independent of the gun. But, while you could remove this or machine out the flash hider, you were not supposed to have the bayonet lug. So if you found an original front sight, you would still need to machine off the lug. That's because you were basically allowed to have one evil feature plus the ability to take detachable magazines. And this obviously does. But you were able to have that flash hider because we did not have a pistol grip. That's why AKs don't. So that was you know, during the assault weapons ban. But thank God that thing did sunset. After that, you could install the bayonet lug. Heck, if you found a folding stock, you could even put that on. Now, I already hear a few people going to the comments. What about 922R? I think you know how I feel about that. But, just for completeness' sake, on that list of 20 parts that the ATF, that 922 itself had in, the Springfield, the... Springfield M14, thus the Noriko Polytech M14, has 16 countable parts. Meaning, 10 parts can be foreign, 6 parts need to be domestic. That was pretty easy because 3 could be in a mag. Get a pre-ban, or even post-ban after 04 mag, and there you've already got 3 parts. And if you're going to replace your front sight, this counted as a part, because you're probably going to get a U.S.-made, either commercial or military front sight. So there you have four. Stock was another easy one. A lot of people didn't like the quote-unquote chew wood. We'll call it commercial walnut stock. So a lot of people would get a GI stock. And back in the day, you could get beautiful, untouched GI stocks from good old Fred's for like 25 bucks. So basically, why wouldn't you? That gets you up to five. So you only really needed one more. Uh, upper handguard could count. That'd be easy. But a lot of people went for a U.S. bolt. And you could fit a U.S. bolt, like I said, even still keep your Chinese barrel. But it would require some fitting, basically head spacing. But that's typically what people would do if they cared about 922R. They would do stock, bolt, magazine, and the flash hider muzzle device assembly. Of course, you know, you could pick any you wanted. And some people would only buy these because they were so affordable just for their receivers and then rebuild using USGI parts. You know, they, they were affordable. Even today, they're still not bad. Not like Chinese AKs. And there we have it. Five claims about the Chinese M14S, M14 Sporter. And I was trying to think of something different to bring you, because we've been doing a lot of AK stuff late, lately. Kind of a holiday treat for everyone, but change is good. And then this came in. Again, sorry, didn't shoot it, but it's going to shoot very similar to the American. And um, this is a nice smooth gun. And so is this. It's got a nice bolt on it. China did a really good copy here. They, they copied a lot of things. They did 1911s. Their shotgun copies are maybe some of their weaker, but then again, also cheaper. That's kind of the main draw here. But if you own one of these or have knowledge, please do share it because I'm just kind of sharing with you what the, the bits and bobs that I know. Personally, my conclusions. No way did these have any real connection to Taiwan. China made them for some international shenanigans, something like that. Number two, while these are slightly different receivers from the U.S., they're probably every bit as good, especially as a semi-auto only for civilian purposes. Great base. Trust it. Number three, the bolts, while probably the weakest part of the gun, aren't an automatic death sentence and have been super overblown. 
it's a small issue that was turned into a big one. Just, you know, be smart about it. But otherwise, don't worry. There's bigger things in life to worry about, like the cost of 7.62 ammo these days. Number four, as much as I would like the side-marked Polytech IDEs to be the best of the best and clearly superior to not only the Norinkos but other Polytechs, the fact is they all came from the same factory, so I just don't think there's noticeably huge difference between them, with perhaps saying maybe a 1993-94 gun might be somewhat better made than a 1988-89, but that's really using conjecture. I think people just like Polytechs and respect them, so that's kind of what they go with. And I think fit and finish probably depends more on the individual workers and day of the week than it does anything else. But again, again, I'm, yeah, feel free to share your own thoughts. And finally, number five, the dates. The 89 import ban on rifles only affected these a very small amount, and it's easily correctable. But the April 94 sanction on Chinese rifles killed them dead in their tracks, even guns in customs. However, the September 94 crime bill assault weapons ban had basically no effect on these because imports were held to a different standard already and Chinese guns were banned already. So, yeah, no real effect there. So if you are in the market for an M14 and you find a good deal on one of these lightly used in a store and everything else checks out, I'd go for it. They're good shooters, interesting pieces of history, and they haven't gone crazy on the prices yet. With that, guys, I'm going to let you go. As always, if you could, please do like, share, and subscribe. And again, if you'd like to help support the channel this year, check out our link to Patreon. And, uh, hey, what's your favorite 308 762 NATO gun to take to the range? I've kind of already shared mine over the years. What's yours? This is Misha, and we'll all catch you very soon next time.